If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this episode of Mind Pump, for about seven minutes, uh, we do our typical bullshitting. Uh, we talk about... <laughs> Our favorite da, 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 da. game show. Little that's, reminders. That's little the, throwback there. That's the wrong yeah. song there. <laughs> that's, that's, right. Right. <laughs> no, that's not, that's not, that's not, that's not, that's not what it. What is that? It isn't anything. It should be something, yeah. I feel like. We talk about our favorite game shows. Then we get into the questions. We answer the question, is technology more of a blessing or more of a curse to humanity? This was a heated debate. And a lot of it from a fitness and health standpoint. Also... I talk about my specific way that I'm doing right now to reset my gut. If and you have gut Adam issues, hijacks it. how if, to fix Sal's tummy. If you think you have gut issues and you want uh, to figure out how to reset it and start over, you might want to listen to the second question of this episode. Also, we talk about the tips on how we can ensure that you're well nourished while eating intuitively. Some people actually under eat when they think they're listening to their body and we help you with the signs of that. Also, is there any truth to muscles being burned during steady state cardio? Are you going to burn all your muscle off with cardio? Mm, is that right is now. that a myth? Find out in this episode. Also, lastly, we got a lot of new listeners uh, coming into our podcast uh, recently. And for you, we've put together the Mind Pump Starter Pack. This includes our foundational MAPS program, MAPS Anabolic, Plus the MAPS Prime, which has a self-assessment tool, helps you correct imbalances and set up your workouts. We also include a nutrition component. That's the nutrition guide and the fasting guide. And we also give you access to our forum, which is probably mm. the best value of all of it. On our forum, we have trainers, we have fitness professionals, we Doctor, have ourselves on Doctors, there. nurses, all kinds of brilliant minds. It's awesome. Uh, the reason why we're throwing it in there is because we know people will get started and they're going to need... Yeah some guidance as they're going oh, this through the This is the, the best programs. introduction to what we have to offer that we've put together. It's literally over half off the price of all that stuff on this particular bundle. You can find it all at mindpumpmedia.com. Our next contestant, Justin Andrews. <laughs> Drew, I already feel like a rock star. Did you watch that? Is it Drew Carey who does it now? Does Drew Carey do the Price is Right? Yeah, he does it right. So, that was the fucking show that was on when I was home sick from school. Come on down. Yeah, that's when you'd watch it, right? You're home sick from school, and it was always like. And then when they spin the wheel, you 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 think the old lady's like gonna get crushed. Yeah. I always I always find it fascinating shows like that. That like stand the test of time. Like that. When did that start? Like the seventies. Yeah, I think it did. The whole it was like it's you know the, the ultimate hasn't hangover changed. show, and the set hasn't. It's changed. A, it's like exactly the same. That's what's epic. Like if you created that, like you're brilliant because yeah. to not have to like really evolve it that much, other than maybe changing the host after he died. <laughs> like yeah. he he ran that thing for thirty years, mm-hmm. and then you can move to now, the next. Bob Barker. Now that's the one where people have to guess the prices of products, right? Yes. There's always this asshole, the one dollar right? guy. Yeah, there's always that asshole one, who's like, one yeah, dollar. I guess four dollars and fifty cents, uh, Bob. And then the next, or day somebody like, will be like four fifty one. Yeah, exactly. Like, like you, two ninety eight. They'll do <laughs> two ninety nine. Well, you remember the, the <clears throat> you remember how that works, right? So if you go, if you guess over the price, you lose. you're out. No matter what. even if you're a dollar, yeah. you're right on. You're one over. You're wrong. All right, real quick on the count of three, your favorite game show. Uh, I got yes. it. I got it. Okay, yeah, on three. Yeah. One, two, three. Family Double Feud. Dare. What'd you guys say? Ooh, Family uh, Feud. The dating game. I said Double Dare. Oh, da- do you know they brought the dating game back? Did they? You didn't see that? No. Bro. No, they brought, I didn't Yeah, see they that. brought the dating game. Oh, no, wait. They brought Love Connection back. Oh, uh, Remember that different. one? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll be back yeah. in two and two. Yeah. yeah. What was yours again? Double Dare. Oh, oh yeah, where they slime a, you? That was a Nickelodeon one. That was Dude. the throw, that was throwback legit. right there. Yeah. Yeah. Do they still do that? They don't still do Double that. Double dare. Yeah, and it was a slime. Everything was slime on Nickelodeon. That was the that they was invented the thing. slime. That was the gimmick. Yeah. You, what is 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 Nickelodeon they, still going? They must yeah. have you guys have kids, right? So is, is this a big shit. is this a big deal still? Is Nickelodeon like kicking ass? It's it's huge. I mean, yeah. it, it got so it's that all was cartoons though. Now. This was our time. You guys know that, right? Like Nickelodeon didn't exist before us. Like it was it came during our. Actually, you know they do these. The, these like uh, adventure games where they have kids on like iPads and they have to like run around some resort and like find stuff. It's like a treasure hunt or whatever, and like that's like the new thing now. Well, Nickelodeon, I think, was the first channel 
all for kids. Mm-hmm. Before yeah. that, there wasn't any. Now you've got a Cartoon Network and all these other... But Nickelodeon was the shit. There was one... They got SpongeBob. Do you guys remember that SpongeBob one the best. that one show on Nickelodeon? I think it was called You Can't Say That on Television. Yeah. Oh my god, that was great. I don't re- I don't remember that. I do, yeah. Remember and then there was the dude like the cook in the back and he made like gross ass food for the kids. Yes. And there was always fart jokes. Yeah. It was the most inappropriate show. God, you're taking me back. For I totally kids. F- like like deleted that. Doug, from pull my up brain. you can't say that on television. It yeah. was so I guarantee you watched it. I don't remember. I feel like Nickelodeon wasn't the one that had American Gladiators in it, did it? Oh my god, that was amazing. I love that show. No, that was that was like ABC. One of my that, was, that was like regular TV. Yeah, that was good. No, I loved Nickelodeon. Blaze. I used to watch Nickelodeon and then when, but this is of course pre internet porn. I watched so a lot of MTV. Imagine okay, imagine where we have the <laughs> wagon got distracted. Imagine where we have the wagon up here. You know the wagon? How cool oh, would the it, Chinese how wagon? cool uh-huh. would it be to have one of those tennis ball guns? Yeah. And you have to, and we create a little off- obstacle course right here on the grass. Yeah, that you have to get all the way to underneath without getting pelted Dude. with the fucking the, the gun. <laughs> you can't do that on television. That's it. No, that, so it's you got to click on like the YouTube. This isn't it, huh? No, that's it. But that top thing is part of the website. So you can't. Do you see how it says you can't do that on television, Nickelodeon? Dude, it was such a. I don't. Dude, rem- you know on Gladiators. You- okay, what event? Here's my question to you guys. What event do you think you would have dominated? Oh, uh, that's a on, great one on Gladiators. Mine, I know- mine is the one where they had like, so they had everybody kind of cornered in this um, uh, shoot. So you had to try and like run past these these gladiators. I remember that were trying that. to beat on you, and you had to like basically wedge your way through. Of course you'd do that one. Oh my god, I would have killed those Because you're a, you're a yeah. juggernaut. That was like my thing. I, I always jousting. wanted to do that. Jousting, 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because there's there's technique involved in jousting. Oh, we should have... There's a- I feel like Adam would have done the rings one, where you like like you put your legs and you try and like like pull somebody down off the rings. And oh, swing. I forgot about that. That would be a good yeah. one. Use yeah, your my, mon- my limbs. Yeah, yeah. I like the one where you they had the... Um, the little barrels. They had all the barrels like on a little football field and you had to get the balls in the barrels and they were trying oh, to, and yeah. the center one was worth the most points. The outside barrels were worth less you points. You tried to run uh, yeah, you, and, and yeah, avoid the yeah. and gladiators. Had, and had, you know, it was like those tippy, you know, tippy cups that uh-huh. would, you know, bounce back up and you have to try and get it in there. What, okay, so was this a cartoon or was this a, you, gotta, you guys got to fill me in here. I don't remember this. Oh, uh, uh, no, it was a TV show. It was like a variety show. So it, it And they would do lots of skits and stuff. Yeah, on, I literally no, remember zero So can, can you tell me the, why is it called, uh, not, what's it called? Not, you can't can't do that on television because the skits were super inappropriate. Yeah. They were all fart and barf jokes and okay, so the cook in the school would always throw up in people's food. <laughs> that was his thing. <laughs> what yeah. the hell? I'm yeah. going to have to watch all these yeah. like after this. I think it's time to summon the purr. The quad bird. Bring on the purr. Step right up all you bearded men and all you bearded ladies. This quad is brought to you by Big Top Beard Company, whose all-natural beard oil products not only make your beard smell amazing, but feel amazing, too. Their organic essential oil blends transport you to manly places like the mountains, the desert, the sea, and beyond, all while encouraging a lot of beard nuzzling to boot. Buy it for yourself or as a gift for that special bearded someone at BigTopBeardCompany.com. Enter the discount code Mind Pump for 33% off at checkout. All right, our first question is from Jeff Crable. Technology has been both a blessing and a curse to humanity. Do you think the benefits outweigh the damage tech has done to humans? Wow. Oh, it's easy answer. I see. I knew. I knew you were going to lean this way, so I grabbed this question. Well, I'm, okay. <laughs> let's let's just consider for a second that. The that humans die, died at incredible rates with them for infection, lack of water, so if lack we're gonna, of food, if and yeah, if we're gonna do medicine and stuff like that, then of course, well, it's technology. Yeah, you're mm. right. I mean, that's I, I just don't. I think when someone says technology, I think of like all the tech stuff, dude. You think of like yeah. which I guess you could all the convenience. Well, let's look at the last. Let's look at the 20th century. Let's just look at the 20th century. In yeah, the 20th, the 20th century, or even just how about the last 20 years, dude? How about that? The last twenty years? Yeah, just the last twenty the years. The last twenty years. Because okay, all the fucking all the major shit is is handled. You got to go back a little more than that. No, why? Why? Be, uh, because uh, in in terms we'll of just you, the start of the internet. Let's start. There. Because, yeah, because, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Let's let's talk. Let's okay. start with the internet and all let's right. speculate. Obviously, so it's longer than twenty. Obviously, years the, the, obviously yeah. nobody is it. Yeah, yeah, yeah a little bit oh, more. Yeah, a little yeah bit you're more. looking at. 
You're looking at right around 25, maybe probably 25, yeah, 30. Probably. Yeah, it's not just the invention of the internet, but when it started to get widespread use. Oh, yeah, it might be 30 years. So ago. no, not th- dude. Dude, because you had Oregon Trail when you were a kid. That yeah. wasn't the internet yeah, though. I mean, that was computers. I know, but like right after like, that, the like internet AOL. Came. Dude, dude, dude yeah. was that was a, that's fucking that was going high school, bro. Ooh. Was it? Yes. I thought it felt like it was. What, yes, when we were dude. 10. It was 90s. It was in the 90s. Yeah, that, which is which is more than 1990. Years right there, I can see it. Okay. No, uh, really. The, what does that say there, Doug? You, internet use grew rapidly in the West from the mid '90s. Yeah, so mid '90s. So you're looking at about 25, 30 years if you want to go back right. far. Fair enough. So I'll tell you this much: 25, the last 25 and 30 years saw such a dramatic reduction in worldwide poverty that you can't compare almost any other time in human history to that. Now the la- the the whole end of the 20th century was like that, but when the internet really kicked in. You saw people um, lift themselves out of poverty, and a lot of it has to do with the ability of the internet to connect uh, people to each other, to uh, to offer opportunities to other businesses. You've got people in other countries now offering their services. For example, if you need someone to edit your website or whatever, you can hire someone in Bangladesh who will do it for you, who does a very, very good job. People are you know getting more services. They're able to communicate in term for efficiency of uh, you know allocating resources by far technology has been uh, a blessing that doesn't mean there aren't side effects and negatives so I'm not saying it's all been a blessing yeah, economically it's been it's been positive and I think that's what you're saying right now but what about what it's done to us socially and mm-hmm. what it's what it's physically yeah physically socially like there's I think you have to factor all of that in if you look at it as a whole right so we could say we could say that Okay, for sure. Like, and 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 let's be honest, we are a perfect example of somebody who benefits from technology. I mean, twenty years ago, we could not sit on a radio show and talk to yeah. you know millions of people all over the world. Like, we have we have fans. We would like, have to tour, you know, all over the place. People that listen to the show in places I've never been, and yeah. you know, like I have. Mm-hmm. So the the ability to do that, and we have many people that we contract work out that are overseas. So mm-hmm. without a doubt, like. You know, technology has served us very, very well when it comes to you know making money and it's advanced. by far connected like more of the world. You yeah, know? like you have more access to 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 people all across the world, but which is, which is a benefit. I think it is the number one contributor to obesity. I think that technology, because cars and computers and you know these automated services and driving it to you instead of you actually having to go to it is the leading reason why we are overweight. Mm. I think that we are grossly, and there's stats to prove this, that a woman in the, the early 1900s would be you know, burning 4,000 calories a day. That's insane. Yeah. That a woman could eat uh, 4,000 calories and not gain fat. The average female gains weight now off of 1,500 calories, which would technically put you nutrient deficient. So- and technology, in my opinion, is largely responsible for that. Mm. You know, it's interesting you, you, you say that there was this huge uh, study, and I think it was published in National Geographic, where they went and they studied um, uh, hunter-gatherer societies that still exist, exist today. And they did some very advanced um, testing where they could test how many calories someone burns. And there's a machine that does this, and it has to do it. You, like, you breathe into it, and it... I don't know all the details, but it's about as accurate as a test as you can have in terms of testing uh, calorie expenditure. Because we can calculate calorie expenditure and say, oh, well, you should be able to burn this many if you do this much activity or whatever. Right, but But we know it's super inaccurate. The most accurate tests that we have require an expensive machine to do so. And so they've actually done this. They've actually tested calorie burn in some of these uh, hunter-gatherer societies. And you know what they found? (laughs) Hmm. Uh, they concluded that the obesity epidemic is not the result of inactivity. These people's bodies, what they found, because they were so active uh, all the time, it was their lifestyle that they their bodies that is a normal. Their bodies adapted and yeah. became very efficient. And we talk about uh, adaptive thermogenesis, mm-hmm. and we've examined this in athletes as well, where you have a high level athlete who is a swimmer who's very efficient at swimming and they'll measure calorie burn and their bodies become so efficient at that whatever movement that they're doing that they burn substantially less calories than we calculate. 
And the authors concluded, and by the way, this is still contested. So this is. I was going to say, I, I disagree with this because I, I, I know for sure well, where I, I can't wish I remember like you do and have a photographic memory could remember where I read this study. But I definitely remember reading this. I and think I, there's a multitude of and factors. And where, where, where I would give on this is that I believe that there is a medium there. So maybe the study that I read was, uh, you know, grossly exaggerated that maybe a, the woman, the women weren't eating 4,000 calories, but you can bet your ass she was moving four times the amount as the average female is now today. Well, well that, you, now, had, you had to. Now, you, now, so here's the thing that you want to consider. The obesity epidemic took off uh, after America was pretty modern already. Um, so if you look at the obesity epidemic and re- when you look at the chart of obesity, really start to like explode. It happened right around the 80s. Now, right around that point, we had still a large percentage of the population in America that had uh, office and desk jobs. And uh, it took off. And it didn't. It doesn't necessarily match the lack, of, the the less of the activity. Now, if you look at childhood well, obesity, wait a second. What about what? What also happened in the you know seventies, eighties, and nineties with with women and working more? The the increase of women in jobs and let's be most jobs being sedentary type jobs. Why wouldn't that contribute to? Well, that? so if you look at if you compare the, if that were the case, then then the obesity rates of women would increase faster than the than the obesity rates of men but they're not they're actually hmm. right next to each other now the big explosion that uh that we're seeing more recently is the explosion of childhood obesity and that uh that can be very connected to activity cuz children uh are definitely not as active as they used to but if you again take it a step further when they look at children who play lots of sports and who are very active they're, they're still suffering from this rise in obesity. Mm. So what they're concluding is that, and this is not to say you shouldn't be active, by the way, because here's what you need to understand is if you move and you don't lose weight, you're still going to have health benefits. So uh, although you do get health benefits from, benefits from the weight loss as well. So what's, and this is fascinating. Like I said, these authors were blown away that these hunter-gatherer societies weren't burning nearly as many calories as they thought, and they were like walking all over the place and trekking and mm-hmm. walking to get water and hunting and do it. They and they're adapted like, to their environment. They were not burning. And it's think about it. Think about it this way: the human body well, evolved in a state of high activity and in a state of low food availability. Mm-hmm. It doesn't make sense that the human body would just burn a shit ton of calories and stay that way all the time, especially if you're not you don't have access to tons of food. So although I, of course, 100% think that activity plays a role in it, I think the bigger role has to do with our nutrition. I think that has mm. a bigger, but I think they both play a big role. Well, I think, I think both of those things, but I think it's also the environment and the simplicity of the environment. So I feel like it's one of the, one of the reasons why uh, we're, we're so like bombarded with our daily, like we get distracted all the time with like this overstimulus. So there's flashing lights, there's all these things like I'm driving, there's there's all these like cautionary uh, like mechanisms that are going off in your body where you're in a constant state of stress. Mm. Like even though we don't think it's stress, like flashing lights, oh my God, like it, it sends a response and, and I have a certain uh, degree of, of a hormone response like to stress. And so, and, and, and on top of that, the job and, and, and then now like food being so readily available, people have that as like a comforting mechanism. And so then they're going to eat and, you know, maybe it's not the best, uh, you know, it's overly processed, you know, it's not the best options as far as nutrients are concerned. And, you know, and they're not, they're not as active as they were before. So all this like environment is more conducive to sitting and uh, being stationary while I'm overstressed. So I feel like there's just so many factors that, uh, are working against us that it's 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 a result of this is is getting down to the childhood level. So I want to take your what you're talking about stress and I want to hone in it hone it in a little bit because I think we've been hammered for the last, you know, I don't know, 15 years or so that stress is the cause of all of our ailments. And the the message has been to reduce stress. The reality is uh that's the wrong message. The the right message is 
we're having the wrong kinds of stress and we're not having the right kinds of stress. Right. Uh, so we're not managing it. Uh, or, argu- in a way. or arguably too much of. It, I versus, feel like it's, a, it's, it's wrong overwhelmed, or... like to where they're not focused. Well, I'll Cause, give Because any stress could be technically good. This is a topic yeah. that we got into with Andy and Barbell Shrugged, right? Yes. Is that, mm-hmm. that even a flashing light stress could technically be maybe good for us to get to create a response, our body adapt, and then, but it's the constant. Same stresses all the it's time. The wrong, it's the wrong kind, uh, too much of the wrong kind and not enough of the right kind and the balance of the... T- because we're... Okay, we're going to be... We're, people are complete morons if they think that 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, humans weren't stressed out. Let's be honest. Like, you're looking for food every day. You're way more it's stressed. It's cold yeah. as fuck. Just different types like, of stress. Yeah, like yeah. different kinds of stress and... They may have had uh, reprieve uh, differently than we do. Like if you're out in the in, in nature and you just got food, which was your major stress, and you ate that food, you've got reprieve from it. It's quiet. You're outside. I'm, ooh, we're safe right now. Like ah, oh, it's calm. Like they've got reprieve from that. Whereas maybe this type of stress that we're exposed to now is low level. Like I'm not going to starve. I'm not going to get killed. But it's this constant nagging. All day long, never ending, you know, stress story that happens. You know, before I go to bed, I'm on my phone, I'm checking emails. I, I, even on vacation, I'm checking emails. I'm, I never go out into nature, I never shut shit down. And on top of it, the average person doesn't get the right kind of stress. So they're not moving, they're not getting that stress. Yeah. Or they're not getting sunlight, they're not getting that stress. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, here's the thing with technology is this technology <clears throat> is a 100% uh, powerful tool. And that tool is can be used in many different ways, and uh, it can be used negatively. Like let's use uh, let's talk about human connection. Adam, you had mentioned like how con- how we don't have connection in the same ways. The reality is with technology today, you have the av- the ability to be more connected than ever in all of uh, all of humanity. Now, I could use that technology to disconnect. Well, so okay, now I, I got to challenge that way of thinking because I used to say the same thing too. And when you really think about it, though, and this is and this is what I kind of see the the what it scares me of the future. And I I brought this up on the podcast one time when I was standing up at uh, HP and we're inside our suite and I'm looking down at the arena, and uh, and I've been there for years going kind of the same spot. And I remember you know you kind of get used to seeing the same crowds of people, and over the last like four or five years, it's gotten very normal now when I look down that literally. Every single person till the game starts is in their on their phone and they have a friend or a family member that's sitting on their left and their right, yet they're connected all over the world with other friends on yeah. Facebook and this and that. Meanwhile, they have a person that's living, breathing right next to them that's a loved one or a family or a friend, and they're but they're being more connected to maybe 10 of their Facebook friends right there, but then they're disconnected and present with the person that's right next to them. So you have to ask yourself, you know, even though you're technically becoming more connected to people, is it healthier for us socially uh, and physically, mentally, and and spiritually? Yeah, I I wouldn't consider that more connected. I think, Mm -hmm. like I said, it's a tool. And you know, well, I think it's that's how it's being managed. That's how it's being used, though. Well, we we know that, right? Managing it in the it it the acceleration of its growth is. I feel like that's the the cautionary tale because we haven't even been able to really manage where we are currently with our technology yet to adapt to the environment because it's changing so fast. Well, here's what we do very well. Okay, is we blame uh, inanimate objects on uh, the human condition. So you always hear the term uh, money is the root of all evil. Money's a, money is a fucking piece of paper. I could put a stack of money on this table. If we leave it there, it won't do anything to anybody. Money also represents uh, an exchange of goods and services, and it is by far the the, the symbolic uh, the symbol of money. Being able to trade with someone, so I don't need to have what you want in terms of my products or services. I just need to have money, and now I can get what you have. And now people can trade with anybody, and it is literally. The one of the root causes of the growth of civilization, or at least one of the root tools, but yet we say money is the root of all evil. No, people do evil shit 
to get more money, just like they did evil shit to get more resources. And people will use technology yeah, but to you, feed I get the par- some bullshit. The, and so, no, I don't think, I think it's- I uh, think the par- the parallel you're drawing, I get where you're, you, but money and technology are not the same thing. Like it's, uh, They're both an ad- object. One, one of them is required to live, Okay. Money is required. So is technology. No, it's not. Absolutely. No, it's not. You just we just talked about hunter gatherer people that do, probably don't have Facebook. Bro. Well, I mean, it depends sh- what you consider technology. A hunter gatherer uses technology too. Yeah, they they use well, the tech. They figured out how to sharpen a rock and make it into. A I spear. mean, it's all technology. Your phone is just is 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 thousands of years down the line from a spear. Um, it's all the same. And by the way, the guy who invented the spear invented a very effective way to, to hunt, but he also effected, uh, invented a very a new way of waging war and killing other people. Yeah. So my point is, uh, we're always hum- mankind is always in this conundrum where we invent these tools, mm. and our nature is to either use it for good or allow our inner whatever to come out and it to be used for bad. That's, but, a, that's a fair point. Yeah. But to, if you look at overall, since the invention of new technology today, worldwide, it's unequivocally a blessing. But there's some major side effects. You're right. I mean, people don't use, a lot of people don't use tech to connect. They use it to disconnect. Like they're in a, a, a busy room you know, they're in a coffee th- shop and they want to escape to their phone and just well, not. Well, I think around. people are are you know constantly assessing their environment and they're trying to innovate processes, right? So that, that's part of us trying to um, uh, improve constantly. And I think that that's great. That's what human beings are. But a lot of times we we improve on things at you know with the side effect that goes with that, right? So if uh, we make more comfortable chairs or, you know, we, we make a process where it eliminates uh, us having to, you know, walk to work every day. Mm-hmm. Um, like we didn't we didn't really like have the foresight to see the effect of, you know, what that's going to produce onto the human body. And, and it's like now we're. We're, we're kind of like... It's new problems. It's new problems that we're trying to still kind of gather the pieces together. And I guess that's why my cautionary thing with it is like, it's it, not only has it like grown substantially, it's just going to keep growing. And, uh, you know, where where will we be? You know? Well, here's well, here's something you want to look at because, you know, we, we always hear people say, especially people who advocate like um, ancestral type dieting, right? Like, oh, you know, most of human evolution happened, uh, you know, up until about 10,000 years ago. Then you had the agricultural revolution or whatever. And we haven't evolved physically too much since then. In other words, I could take a human from way back then, and if I cut their hair, cleaned them up, put them in modern clothes, you wouldn't be able to tell, tell the difference. Now, this is very true, but what is not, not said is that the human mind, the way we think, evolves all the time, and the evolution of that happens faster and faster and faster. So we're stuck with primitive bodies, primitive desires, but with these minds that are evolving very quickly and able to invent things to cure certain things. But now we're dealing with new pitfalls. So, so when the you- fuck are our bodies going to evolve? That's so weird to I me. Know. Our bodies, our like, bodies will start to catch up. Like when can, well, when am I going to be able to just turn skin. my hand into a yeah. spear? Like what yeah. the fuck? Te- <laughs> Technology is going to be able to, to Bro, eventually do that. But think about it this way. Bug eyes. Think about how fast the, like, m- the minds of humans have advanced in just the last 50 years. Think about it. Uh, go a hundred years. Fuck, you know, well, we had segregation, you know, a hundred years ago. Today, if you brought that up somewhere, people would think you were crazy. That's an evolution of the mind. Look at how women were treated. Look at how we look at gay marriage. Over 20 years, that has completely changed. Our, you know, our thought process on lots of things have changed very, very rapidly. And look at, okay, we're in the fitness and health industry, right? And we've seen an obesity epidemic that is happening rather recently, but it started not that long ago, like 40 years ago, it kind of started taking off. And then if you look at the whole scheme of things, that's a blink of the eye. And now you're starting to see, if you look at like soda consumption, it's starting to drop. Uh, you're looking at uh, snack food consumption, is starting to change. Foods are being marketed differently because I think people are starting to catch on. It just takes takes time, but technology's making that shit happen faster and faster. I just hope that we can advance 
faster than our follies will kill us. You know well, I was just going to say along the lines of the killing and the, you know, you gave the analogy of the spear, which I thought was a great analogy that that's also a technological tool that has evolved that's used for hunting and has helped us. And then it's also used for killing. Where do you start to question and ask yourself like the question is the beginning of circling back to the real question, which is, is it outweighing the damage that it's actually doing? Are some of these tools, this this tech, you know, we're, we're saying all the things that's great about it, but when, when does it become more of a weapon than it does become something to help us hunt and, and live and survive? Well, like, is, is Facebook uh, so, uh, that it's like much a of a duality? It's, yeah. like, it's a constant, you know, pull from one to the other. Like, how, how much of, of some of these things, these, you know, how, how much is, is Snapchat really helping yeah. us hunt? You know, and how much of it is it really killing us? Like, so it's not well, direct. You get the atom bomb. Well, here's you know? the thing: you can't. It's hard to do that. And economists talk about this all it's the time. Hard, it's hard but, to make a direct. It's hard, connection. but don't we need to? Don't we need to think of it like that? I well, mean, don't we can. We... we can. But here's an example: like people will say, "Well, why do we have entertainment? Like, let's eliminate entertainment. It's not feeding us. It's not giving us food or shelter. But we do know that that does play a role in quality of life, and that probably does improve." To some extent, uh, the quality of you know humanity. So it's very diff- difficult to do those direct connections. But I will say this: you, I think me, technology I, will benefit us more than be our detriment until the point, and hopefully this never happens, where technology kills us all. Because <laughs> of all the risks, and this is true, of all of the risks that we face yeah. in the near future, probably one of the biggest risks is, is our own creation. Is us? Yeah. Like, let's be honest: we have enough nukes in the world to destroy everybody several times over. We have the technology to create viruses that will kill all of mankind. We have lot we have technology that we could set off these EMP bombs and send the whole world into the stone age which would result in mass 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 starvation and death. So at the moment I fear our ingenuity more than I fear almost anything else. The well, only thing that aren't we they, aren't they directly connected? Uh, well, I'm talking about like like I don't fear like a meteor hitting us and explode. No, I know, but our, yeah, but I mean technology and our intuit uh, and the, the, your ability to create all this technology. Oh yeah, no, no, I no, mean that's I'm just saying the same thing. I'm just right? saying perfect example is artificial intelligence. You yeah, know? like so once we get to that sort of pinnacle of technology, uh, I feel like we're we're going to be in some hot water of how to manage that. We, I mean, we can be, we can be, or it could be an incredible blessing. We literally have no idea. Up until now, all I'm saying is up until today, so far, technology has been more of a blessing than a curse. And of course, there's yeah, periods I of time. I agree with well, that. I, and and I, I think we all do. And I also, this is where I have faith in humanity is that what you see, and this goes back to our free market, we're all huge fans of that. And when you think about what's happening right now in the market, yeah. if you follow it, there's this huge rise in mindfulness and your meditation places and your massage therapy yeah. and your float and tanks. using technology exactly to and bring you there. So yeah. now, now we're we're using these things to to actually bring us more present, to detach from being plugged in twenty four seven. So I, I do I know the pendulum has has swung pretty far right now. We we've watched in our gener we watched the internet happen. We watched it evolve to the point where people are Snapchatting and connected to their phone nonstop to the point where they're not even having a conversation with the person next to them. So right. we're starting to see it get to the one extreme. And the answer is, you know, you're starting to see now a rise in the counterculture to that, which mm-hmm. I think is mm-hmm. awesome. And that's where I think you have to believe in humanity. And I think the best thing that you can do is those that have families and children is to educate and inform and and uh, be mindful yourself this is something that i mean gosh we're we're in a business right now that you know thrives off of being plugged in and connected and social and all that shit so i actually i mean we've talked about this before we have to, i have to put practices in on a daily basis to disconnect and not get consumed like that because really easily you can. Oh, we carry it with us. Like I mean, all and, day. and I'm 35 going on 36 years old. I can't imagine a, a, a 15, Who's born into yeah, it. a 15 to 20 year old that came out with an iPhone in their hand. Yeah. Like what the, like try but, telling, but they may be more adapted to it. You know, like they, they may like, they're, you know, it's changing the wiring of the brain. It. Yeah, they're they're already like accustomed to the environment of it. It's it's literally changing the way that their brains are wired. They're already yeah. showing this, and they're going to take off with it, you know, and like thrive with it. Whereas we're still trying to ah, yeah. you no, know, figure it out. No, you bring up a great point, Adam, because before food was so plentiful and so palatable, 
obesity was never a killer. It became a killer when we had all this food available all the time. Um, and so all of a sudden we're, you know, we're in a situation which we've never been in before as humans where we have to like manage our food intake. Yeah. Like that never happened before. Right. Or we had to manage our activity before it was like, you just moved uh, too much. Everything's anyway. easy, but now yeah. we have to go back to doing things hard. So now we're going to have yeah. to learn how to manage our right. tech use. Quick interruption by our sponsors. You guys, lots of people have been asking us how they can support the Mind Pump Mafia family. Our first one is our Chimera Coffee that we love. You guys go to ChimeraCoffee.com. That's Chimera with a K for 10% off. Don't forget Mind Pump at the checkout. We also have our Big Top Beard Company.com for 33% off. Also, Mind Pump at the checkout. checkout. Also, Brain FM. We talk so much about this for sleep and meditation. It's Brain.FM for 20% off. Also, Mind Pump at the checkout. You guys, we also talk a lot about books on here all the time. We're using that Audible. You guys can get a free trial, 30-day trial, plus one free audio book if you go to audibletrial.com forward slash mind pump. And then last, we get lots of people asking about Ben Greenfield's CBD supplement, so we hit him up to hook you guys up. You go to getnaturedblend.com forward slash mind pump for that discount. Allison McKee, what are the best ways to reset your gut? She's a forum member, old school, love her. Um, so sh- this was directed at me because she says how, you know, I've talked about resetting my gut. Because you have tummy issues? Yeah. Um, you know, I'm glad you make fun of me about reset, that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, here, so here's the, the what I, when I talk about resetting the gut, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to bring total inflammation down, um, which is number one. And then I'm trying to balance out my internal uh, gut flora. Let's let's talk before you go any deeper. Let's let's talk about what that means because I some people probably hear that and be like, "What does that mean? Your gut is inflamed, and what? Why does that matter? And how does that happen?" Right. right. Like so ex- when you explain, have, explain that to people. So when your gut is inflamed, you, uh, you, the, it becomes more permeable, and things will leak through the gut that usually don't, and get into your bloodstream. Now this is a bad thing because. If let's say I eat uh, you know avocados every day because I like them and they're healthy, but I have an inflamed gut and some of this avocado gets leaks through my gut because it's inflamed and when when your gut is inflamed, uh, it becomes more perbe- permeable and my body what will happen is my body will start to recognize this avocado as a foreign invader and will start to develop antibodies against it. So now I develop an intolerance. To avocado. So, so all of a give, sudden, give me. I'm gonna I'm gonna do an analogy here and tell yeah. me tell me if I'm wrong. So when I when I envision the gut and kind of what ends up happening when someone gets a leaky gut syndrome and from uh you know something that they're consuming or eating, it, typically it's because of the overconsumption of something, right? That has led to this. Is that correct? Am I so gut inflammation can come from a lot of different reasons. Because uh, I I envision like this like a sponge, right? Like your like a sponge is your wall. Mm-hmm. And if you took just a shot of water and you poured it on a dry sponge, none of that water would leak through the sponge. The sponge would actually absorb it up before it even got through. But if that sponge was full of water and then I dumped that shot of water on it, the water would actually drip and leak out. It, it, Is it similar like it's that? It's more like this. Like imagine a screen door with very, very, very tight junctions in between the screen. So like the screen a cheese, door- Like a cheesecloth. Yeah, very, 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 very tight. And if I pour rocks on that, it'll hold it because the mm. rocks won't get through the small junctions. But when it gets inflamed, things spread out and now you've got bigger holes. Okay. So the gut is always permeable. There's are thir- certain things that are supposed okay, to be- Okay, that's where through. I was getting at. Is yeah. so, so it is always kind of like that. It's yes. not like you-, you No, know. it's not like it's just perfectly sealed, whatever. It's just it becomes more permeable and things that- don't normally uh, go through the gut, start to do so, and your body builds antibodies. And so uh, whatever you're eating all the time, all of a sudden, one of the symptoms is like, man, I can't figure out why I have gut issues. I'm eating the same foods. Like that's a symptom. Or God, I used to be able to eat spinach all the time. Now I eat spinach and it fucks my stomach up. You know, that's that's a sign right there. Or it could just be general, you know, uh, gastro issues. Or your stool really messed up. Stool diarrhea. Messed up. It could be or- diarrhea, constipation, those types of things. And so what you want to do is give it a break, number one, um, which is a a prolonged fast. And what a fast does is it gives your gut a chance uh, to reduce this inflammation because it doesn't have to work and heal. Then when you reintroduce food, you want to do it in a very slow manner and you want to utilize uh, beneficial bacteria to uh, kind of help populate your gut. Or, you know, Dr. Ruscio said it just overall has other beneficial effects 
for gut health. And then little by little, I start eating more and more foods, starting with the foods I know I can tolerate and then moving towards the foods that I used to tolerate, but maybe started bothering me. So when you say that now, I think of, okay, the fast pretty much it cleans out the whole gut. So mm-hmm. by fasting two, three days, if I can push that far. 72 hours is is really ideal, Ideal, but that's hard for a lot of people. And I don't even do that. I always go 48 as But most. even if you put, you know, the, the longer you can, the more you're going to clear all out. And then when I go to reintroduce food, I'm going to probably be reintroducing good, healthy, balanced foods that I know are agree with my body. Mm-hmm. And that way it's getting all absorbed and utilized and it isn't backing up or getting press through the gut. Yeah, you, you don't want to go all th- all of a sudden throw stuff at your stomach that's going to cause inflammation again because now you've you've wasted that whole process. Right. So if I went on a 72-hour fast yeah. and then I go run and get a fucking Quiznos sandwich with some of the, you know, Lay's Dorito chips or whatever and and wash it down with the soda, probably not a good not idea. Not a good idea. So and you might have reset your gut and then turn around so right around I, and inflamed it. Again. So what I do is I go 48-hour fast and then I eat one then when the 48 hours is up, I'll eat a meal consisting of uh, well-cooked vegetables a little bit of uh, some kind of a meat, um, and maybe a little bit of rice or some fruit, um, and then that's pretty much it. And then it's the next day where I start to eat a little bit more, a little bit more normal. The reason why I say 72 hours, by the way, is the current science demonstrates that in 72 hours, uh, a lot of your immune system is regenerated. Mm-hmm. So what happens when you fast and you know when you don't eat is uh, your quote unquote old cells die off. Yeah. You and sort then of siphon them out. Yeah, and then when you re when you eat again, you've got this activation of stem cells that then turn into new immune cells. So if you have all this this well, immune yeah. reaction, it's like you're resetting your immune system. Almost. Is it is it fasting is the only thing that we've found that actually has shown neurogenesis? Right. I mean, it, it improves. Neuro- yeah, definitely. It's the only thing, right? I don't think mm-hmm. we have anything else that's proven that, right? Well, dude, prolonged fast will shrink your organs. So you'll do a prolonged fast for like ten days, and your your liver will sh- will shrink by like. I don't know what the number was, but it was pretty substantial, like 10, 20%. Then you refeed yourself, the liver grows back to its normal size, but what's grown back are new, Healthy healthier cells. cells. Yeah, stronger cells, which is yeah. when you think of what, what's amazing and awesome, this is also why fasting is a protocol in all of my clients' diets, regardless of what your fitness goal is, is just that in itself, those health benefits. People don't realize like disease and, and these viruses, they attack the weaker cells in your body. Mm-hmm. So if I can do something in my routine or diet that promotes me getting rid of some of these old, weaker cells in my body and, and regenerate healthy, stronger new ones, that just seems advantageous to, to, to my yeah, body. They're more resistant right. to these and, yeah, diseases. And, and really, it's the older cells that, have, that are more likely to become, that attack you. So autoimmune uh, diseases, uh, autoimmune issues tend to get better when we're able to recycle out of those cells. Uh, older cells are more likely to mutate and become cancerous uh, mm-hmm. as well. So, uh, you so know, to me, it's just a great preventative way to try. I mean, it's not guaranteed that's going to happen, but man, if it just means once a week you got to restrict from food for a well, day. Well, some of the leading scientists re- recommend one prolonged fast uh, a year yeah. where you're doing like a three or four day fast uh, or once every even six months. Now, of course, you got to be healthy, check with your doctor. And if you have uh, st- like really bad stress symptoms from doing this, Probably not a good idea. And the fact that we've let's probably clear, never let's be, fasted. Let's that be long. clear on stress, though. Stress is not that signal of you being hungry and craving a fucking no, ice cream. No, I'm talking <laughs> about not, like hormonal it's, it's Someone's like, oh, oh, this can't be right. I'm so hungry. That right. ice cream sounds so good. Yeah, and it's okay I'm going to break this fast. You got to feel hungry sometimes, like real hunger, mm. you know, not the craving type. Well, of, wouldn't of you guys say, too, like that one of the best things ever for introducing fasting for myself was just that appetite control and realizing when you really need to eat versus when you think you need to eat because you've trained mm-hmm. yourself to like, oh, this is time to eat now, or oh, I haven't had this yet, oh, I want this, mm-hmm. or oh, I'm craving this, or oh, I saw something on TV yeah. that sparked me to want this. Mm-hmm. I think that's been a, a huge one. You know, another another way to reset your gut, uh, if you're not a big um, fasting person, w- w- would also be like the elimination diet, right? Yeah, you just do a full elimination diet and then start reintroducing foods, and you do this over the course of 30 days. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, here's my protocol that I'm doing right now, because I know people are going to DM me and be like, okay, what are you doing specifically? So what I did was is I did 48-hour fast. At the end of the 48-hour fast, I started taking uh, uh, anti-parasite um, natural supplements, which are also antimicrobial. After about the third day, 
I introduced uh, my probiotic again. And then at the end of the day, uh, I take a little bit of activated charcoal because if I am getting a die off of parasite or bacteria or fungus, the charcoal will bound, bind to it at the end of the day and help me get rid of it so I don't get these toxic uh, side effects. And I can't, for the life of me, remember the names of the brands of the anti-parasite. Uh, it's a 15-day course. It's Paragon, and, uh, right? uh, No, that's no, not the right one. one. Here's what we'll do. At the, end of the, at the end, I'll look them up and we'll put it in the show notes so you can see exactly uh, what I'm taking you when get, I'm can doing Can you get this. it on Amazon? Uh, yes, that's okay. where I bought everything on Amazon. Okay, cool. Next one. Dude. Next up is Alessandria21. Tips on how to ensure you are well nourished while eating intuitively. What are some signs that you may be under eating for the amount and type of training you are doing? I like this question a lot. Yeah, it's good because we always assume people overeat. There's a, there's a lot of people out there who just I actually have a client like this right now who has a tendency to not want to eat. I'm um, I'm this person. This is why this is so close to home for me right now. And I'm it's and I kind of know I kind of knew better going into it. But to to now see what's happening with my body already and to be tracking again and paying attention, it's very obvious to me. Um, and I'll tell you right away signs that my body was telling me that I was just ignoring because at that time I was so focused on intuitive eating that I was like, I don't care if I lose some muscle. But I lost muscle. I lost strength. Um, you know, so those two, I think are, are huge indicators that your body is lacking nutrients right away. Or like, maybe just lacking calories. Yeah. Cause lacking nutrients would be like stronger, like I'm losing, well, you know, my yeah, hair, I'm, yeah, yeah. Out. my yeah. fingernails are getting brittle and I'm right. getting all the, you know, I'm bruising easily. That kind your of stuff. Breath right? smells really bad. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and in my yeah. case, I, I Why are you looking cause at I me? wasn't really, I wasn't losing a lot of weight really. I didn't lose that much weight. I lost a few pounds and then kind of covered around this two fifteen range, um, so I didn't keep losing weight. So my calories were up. But what was happening was when I was intuitively eating and I wasn't tracking, I was gravitating towards, you know, more comfort type foods or enjoying uh, foods that were not necessary, uh, necessarily nu- nutrient dense. And I was missing out on some more nutrient dense type foods. So my calories were kind of about the same, but I was lacking a lot of my micronutrients from my greens and veggies because I wasn't aggressively going after that. I was lacking in my protein intake. My fat and carbs were fine. I was just fine on that because those were easy. Those were things that I naturally gravitated to, but I was missing out on that. And the signs for me is, you know, not increasing strength, not, and in fact, going backwards strength wise and then losing lean body mass. You know, and then other things too, like uh, fatigue. Like if you're not getting a lot of of you know good nutrient dense foods, um, I'll start to notice that my energy levels are are starting to dip. You know, I think it's we should we should be clear too. Like when we talk about intuitive eating, it's a process, and it sounds like your when you say intuitive eating, you were finding that you were intuitively eating not good foods that are not good for you. Yeah. So I don't know if we I don't know if you necessarily want to classify that as intuitive eating as maybe. You were just eating because I think the ideal way to hit, uh, you know, or the ideal place to be with intuitive eating is to make those choices. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but here's the thing that I, that and the problem that I had with it, and this is why I don't know how much of a fan I am of completely intuitive eating. I don't think uh, in all the years I've been training, I don't think I have a client one who is really really ready for that because I even notice now back to tracking that because I'm aware of what I've consumed this far today, like so today I've had two meals already, because I'm very aware of the protein, carbs, and fat that I've consumed, it will play a role in the next meal that I go to consume right now. Where when I was intuitive eating, I was hungry, it was okay, I would make a, I would make a good choice, like, like maybe Chipotle would be an answer right now for me because it's close by, it's quick, it's easy, it's not bad, it wouldn't be considered a bad food, but it may not be exactly what my body is lacking or needing based off the stuff that I had before. Today. Well, let me ask you this. Of all the clients you've trained and all the trainers you've known even, how many people could you would you say could demonstrate a absolute perfect controlled squat, deadlift, overhead press, pull up, uh, you know, those movements? How many people would you say of all of the thousands of people you've been around where you could put them in there and it's like, oh my God, absolutely perfect controlled, no imbalances, no... Recruitment patterns look great. Mechanically? Yeah. Um, 
very, very, very few. Well, yeah, but a lot more than that I could see intuitively but, eating. Of for course, sure. but my point is the goal is to get the person there, right? Even ourselves, we've been working out as long as we have, and I don't think any of us can even demonstrate perfection in certain movements, but the goal is to get there. And my point with intuitive eating is that's a goal. It's a very long goal, and it takes a long time to get there. I've met very few people who I could honestly say – fit the bill. One of them we just mess, met recently was Paul Check, who I could confidently say f- kind of fits that bill. Um, I know I'm way further than I was before, but I think it's just the process. And I think what you're doing now where you're tracking is necessary to get you closer to that. I think you made a, a very, very valuable observation and you're like, hold on a second. I'm making these choices, these food choices. I need to step back a second and make sure I get the right, you know, right types of foods. Yeah. <sighs> I don't know, brother. I don't know if uh, I don't know if you you ever get to a point like that where w- not not knowing, not actually seeing and calculating does not affect uh, what I do later in the day. That's the hardest. That to me is the hardest part. Is and I and I like to think that I'm somebody who can I can look at a meal and go like, okay, that's 32 grams of carbs. That's about 25 grams of protein. That's about 15 grams of fat and about 40 420 grams cal 420 calories. Okay, and I can move on to the next meal. Even being somebody who can do that, uh, until I like really look at it, you know, it's like, oh, I don't know. You know, this is where I was going to go eat, but wow. I'm really under consuming here, so I should probably go yeah. this direction. I, I think now that you're tracking, you're consciously making an effort <clears throat> to eat better, period, right? Because mm-hmm. like, I'm pretty sure you're not going to you know, eat Chick-fil-A or you're not right. going to eat Chipotle as much or you're not going to eat you know, whatever else you, you, you know, or eat your you know, drink. It's the your ritual cocoa. and the regimen. It, that's right? it because like, I, I, I want to be clear with that. Intuitive eating is not this destination that you reach like – after a year of you know you know looking at your tr- it's a long it's a this is a well, long well this is it's like process. having programming like I mean you made a a, a a sort of comparison to training and like from a skill but really it's more like following a program versus just coming in and feeling your way through picking up some weights and doing some stuff and and you can kind of feel where where you may be like ne- like neglecting like certain things like I, I know like certain ranges of motion and certain like parts of my body are getting neglected, you know, based off of like how my body feels and whatnot. But if I'm, I'm literally like being disciplined and I'm following like to the T, like a, a program mm-hmm. in succession, it's like, you know, you, you do see more result. Well, that, so there's a good answer. There's a good point, right? Is I think it really depends on what you want. Right, right. Of course. because really goal because setting. if you look if you look at if I show you my my before pictures, I mean there might be a lot of people out there who'd be like I would love to look like that. Mm-hmm. That's right where I would love to be. And if he eats intuitively and that's kind of where he's at, like awesome. But for me, I I've taken myself to a a deeper level of shape that I enjoy. I like I like who I am. I find myself more productive. Like. Uh, I find myself with more confidence. I feel good. I feel my energy is better. I feel stronger. There's th- certain things that I've connected to that level of fitness. And for me to get to that level of fitness takes a little more tracking and discipline than my intuitive eating. Now, my intuitive eating, I think, keeps me a pretty healthy guy with nice balance and not stressing about measuring or weighing and the things that we've talked bad about before. But I here's the thing that I have to caution mind pump listeners is what we tend to do is when we tell people that, okay, the ultimate goal is intuitive eating and intuitive trading training, and that's the ultimate goal. Then what ends up happening is we get a lot of these listeners that, okay, well, Sal, Adam, and Justin are doing it. Like, I'm going to start doing it right now. Yet then they also have these goals of like they want to be a certain place. And it's like you have these serious goals, and then you're trying to figure out why is it I'm intuitive eating, but I can't oh, yeah. quite put well, this I together. Think, I think, Which this question I feel leads yeah, into that, right? I think like part of it is that's the pinnacle of like awareness of like your own body and like how to influence it. But like having specific goals takes specific practices uh, put in place in front of you. So like weaving in and out of both, I think is is very important. And well, uh, you're you you have a lifestyle. Yeah. There's a way of living for your lifestyle, which would be the intuitive aspect. And within that life, right. within your lifespan, you may have goals. Like I'm not going to intuitively train and eat if my goal is to run a marathon because I know my natural tendency. There you go. For intuitive eating and training is longevity. Like when I listen to my body, I'm doing what's best for it from a longevity standpoint. 
And the reflection of that, for me at least, what I found for my body is I tend to be around 186 to 188 pounds, around 8% body fat. I feel pretty strong. I feel okay with my mobility and I'm pretty good. But if I, but I'm not maximally strong or maximal endurance or maximal any of anything. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. If I have a goal, if I'm like, Hey, you know what? I want to compete in a powerlifting competition. Well, now I need a plan. Right. Now I have to eat a specific way. I have to train a specific way. And they're both, uh, they're, they're both not uh, like opposite ends. They're both using both, use yeah. them together. Yeah. Well, I think it's just, it's, it's where decided. you are. It's where it, it's what your goal is. Yeah. I mean, if you're, like I said, if you're okay, if I was okay with where I was currently at, then what I was doing works just fine, mm -hmm. you know, but at, at one point, you know, I decided, Hey, I want to be big again. Like yeah. I want to get buff That's and it. I want to try and stay mobile, which is going to require me doing this. Yeah, you got to so, really peer into the process of that again with your food. Yeah. And I, and I don't want, and I just want to, you know, I think that's what a lot of what we've talked about just recently about not being dogmatic, making sure that we have balance on the show. Of course, when we talk about, and so we've been talking so much about intuitive eating and, you know, you want to get away from them eventually the tracking because it becomes something that mm. you identify with. And then you stress if you you don't eat right like no the, there's also something to be said that hey if you have specific you know physical goals that you're trying to appeal the fact the I, the idea of you not tracking and not doing that is kind of silly well, because to me that's that it's it's I mean, what gets you in shape is science and math. Yeah, and, and to be and like, unless you're a fucking scientist and a mathematician, and you like are that that intuitive or that in tune with your body, you probably and, need to and, track. And on the same lines, I mean, like right now, I'm not intuitive. I mean, I'm not intuitive eating either. I'm, I'm, well, I mean, in a sense, I'm listening to my body, but I had gut issues. So I had to like pay attention and look at what I got to cut out and really look and see and plan. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's all, it's all part of the same pie. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. BW Lawson, 1973. Any truth to muscle being burned during steady state cardio? Nope. Muscle burn. Yeah. You don't like it just burns off. The, the, the misconception is that you're going to do exercise, like lots of cardio. And of course, if you look at like distance runners and distance athletes, they're all very, very skinny, very little muscle and little little fat. Mm. And people think, oh, their body burned up their muscle. Like it's this tissue that's on your body that your body taps into for energy. This was something that we all got more clarity on in the last two mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. yeah, I remember. I, do you remember who it was, who we spoke with? Uh, I thought it was just... I, don't know, I just remember Sal having this epiphany and yeah. then like texting us. And like, no, it was, oh, yeah, we, had, we actually, sense. it was a guest that we, either a guest or a book we read or something that I, it was like this aha, oh my God, like was this whole time. keto adapted uh, marathon I, guy? So this, this actually occurred to me... Uh, so we okay. So we all knew this actually. We all knew this before that because when we learned like basic, you know, human uh, biology, we all learned that it's actually the last place your body wants to take right, calories right, and yeah. nutrients from. We we understood that. But we understood. That. I was still under the impression that the the I, when your body starts to atrophy, that it was that the body was metabolizing the fat. When in reality, your body is actually adapting to becoming a marathon runner, and it's not advantageous to have this extra muscle. Yeah, that while was you run. That was that text you were talking about, Justin. Because yeah. I was thinking about that, and I'm like, you know, your body just it's you know it always adapts to what you're doing. And if I'm doing lots of endurance type activity then my body's going to adapt to it in, in the best state to be in or the best shape you know, uh, physically to look or to be in when you're doing these endurance things is to have a little bit of weight with muscles that can perform re repetition without fatigue. Mm -hmm. So your body's going to shrink your muscles, not burn them because you're not using them for calories. It's just making you more efficient at your activity. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, you got to be careful with that whole. You know why I say be careful? Because then you'll have bodybuilders and people who want to build muscle who are doing cardio and they're drinking amino acid drinks while they're on the cardio. Like, oh, I don't want to burn muscle. Here, give you the amino acids so I don't burn muscle. So stupid. Yeah, no, that's you're not burning muscle. It's just if you do a lot of cardio, your body starts to figure out like, okay, well, you want to do all this re repetition. Yeah. You've got all these fast twitch it's muscle not fibers. It's advantageous to be super massive no. right, when you're endurance. No, I don't care who you True. are. Yeah. You're more effective at endurance if you're lighter. Yeah. It's just the, it's just the bottom line. You know, I'm going to give an example of somebody. I'm going to call a buddy of mine out because <clears throat> he's somebody who's an IFBB pro who I've watched, you know, train this way for a really long time. And his physique really has not changed at all. He's in incredible shape year round. And he's a pro who's been on the Olympia stage many times. So he's a badass. 
but he just has not built any size to his frame. And I'll tell you, it's because he's a cardio queen. Mm. Because he does cardio two, three times a day, every day, year round, on or off, you know, com- competitive mode or not. And you're sending a signal to your body that it's not advantageous to be a big muscular guy. So the best thing he could possibly do would be to lay off all the cardio that he does. But because there's this misconception. Well, he thinks he'll get fatter. Well, mm-hmm. I don't know. I see. I can't speak on what he thinks. It, it's well. It's a lot of people think they can get fat. Have you seen Tori Woodward before? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah great, so, great physique. Yeah, incredible physique, yeah. right? But it's been the same for like five years now. Like it's you know, and I know most guys that are in the competing circuit, you're continually trying to improve and grow. And I don't mean that as a knock or a slide on him at all. He's like he's fucking badass for sure. But I also wa- I've watched him for quite some time. In fact, his physique was a physique that when I first was getting get starting to compete, I was like, oh, we're close to the same height. He's kind of an ectomorph body type. I can see, I you know, so I compared my physique to his physique as I was sculpting and building, and then I kind of built mine and then kept going. And then I, I put on a lot more. He he, he had staged like like one eighty something mm-hmm. or one ninety. So yeah, I, I, he probably. I mean, someone like that. Let's say you're doing cardio twice a day. Like cut one of your cardio sessions and just drop your calories. Shit, you're not gonna on. you're not gonna gain body fat, but you'll end up probably building muscle, right? Yeah, you're not I, sending that signal absolutely. And so then often. and being more. And then there's other there's another thing about that too is that. You know, and this is the, I try to explain this to people while I was competing. Like, people just tripped out that I did hardly any cardio. Like, I didn't do any cardio till like the last two weeks to get ready for a show. Like, people just did not understand that. And I was like, well, why? I don't need to. Like, if I just walk and move, that's going to create the, a caloric deficit for me that I need just by walking around and moving around. And I'll, I can manipulate everything through volume in my training and through calorie reduction from my nutrition. And then when it comes to like game time, two weeks out from a show, and I need to shred every last pound, then I kick up cardio. Then guess what? My body responds like a motherfucker because it hasn't seen that. It's like this is all new to it. Whereas if you're somebody who is always doing cardio, you're just like we we talked earlier in this episode about you know get the hunter gatherer right like they get adapted mm-hmm. to that moving 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 it's the exact same concept for somebody at the competitive level if you are doing all this cardio in the off season that is really silly for somebody who is trying to is to be to use cardio as a tool to get shredded for a show if you do it in the off season that's silly and if your coach is telling you that's silly too because. You're just you're just sending a signal to your body to get used to that. So then, when you go to get into contest prep mode and you start ramping up the cardio, it's not that big of a difference because you your body is so adapted and used to it. Now, flip that: the guy who doesn't do any cardio and then all of a sudden he introduces a little bit of cardio, his body responds like crazy because it's like, what the fuck is this body doing? It's never got on a stairmaster for thirty minutes before. But you get then you get those extreme people though who are like, all I do is lift and then I don't move because I don't want to burn any extra calories. So you're not talking about doing that. No. Yeah, because you still want to well, be it's, active. And it's move. like what I say. It's always the opposite. Yeah. If you're listening to this right now, you're probably and you're this person who never does cardio. You probably could use a little bit of it in your life because it's good <laughs> exercise for your heart. And I'm not talking to you, bro. And I'm not confirming what you're doing is right. And if you're the other person, like T- Tori, who's a cardio queen, the best thing you could possibly do is to lay off of it for a while, quite a while, like a long while, mm-hmm. and probably not put it, put it back into your routine until you're getting ready for a show. Yeah, absolutely. There's a gym for you. Yep. Uh, 30 days of coaching available for free from Mind Pump. All you got to do is go to mindpumpmedia.com and opt in, and you'll get a ton of information on a everything. Plethora. Plethora. On from wellness to protein intake to fat intake to resistance training, cardio, you name it, it's there. Mindpumpmedia.com. Also, it's a trove of knowledge. I just discovered the other day that a lot of our listeners yes. have never been to our YouTube channel. Uh, it's extremely informative, and you get to watch us demonstrate exercises and techniques for everything from mobility to strength training to fat loss, like the top plus ab- you can see how handsome we are. Oh that's, my god, that's the big plus. It's MPT Mind Pump TV. On YouTube. Lastly, if you want to ask us a question that we'll answer on one of these episodes, go to Instagram. Uh, Mind Pump Media is the page, or you can find our personal pages. Mine is Mind Pump Sal, Adam's Mind Pump Adam, and Justin is Mind Pump Justin. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. 
Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.